Hey, beautiful people. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend or weekday or whenever you happen to be listening to this. Thank you for tuning back into LSTU Podcast, or otherwise known as Let's Solve the Universe. First off, some important announcements. Do you like meeting really nice people? Do you like meeting really awesome people? Then you will want to come out to Mo Mondays. There's a whole bunch of them coming up in the next little while. Mo Mondays Waterloo is happening November 12th. That's two days from when I'm recording this. Mo Mondays Toronto. I thought it was the final Monday of the month. It is no longer. They have moved. They will be having their show November 19th. That is Monday, November 19th. Hence, Mo Mondays. You truly do meet the nicest people at Mo Mondays. You'll want to be there. Guess what? I'm speaking at both of those shows. MoMondays.com for tickets and more information. Do you want to become a better person in life? Sure you do. Want to get that promotion at work? Of course you do. Go to Toastmasters. They changed my life. Toastmasters is where leaders and better speakers are made. It's not a critical analysis of every single fault that you've ever had as a public speaker. It's a look at how you can become even more awesome. Toastmasters.org. Find a club near you. My club, Forest City Toastmasters, just celebrated their 60th anniversary. We meet on Thursday nights at 7, doors open 6.30. But if you are not in the London area, or even if you are, there is a club out there for you. Toastmasters.org. The London Mindfulness Challenge is November 24th, hosted by the London Mindfulness Community. This will be happening at Innovation Works in London, Ontario. Oh my God, this event is going to be amazing. It will be an incredible mindfulness journey that includes sitting meditation, yoga, total relaxation, mindful movement, and lunch. And guess what? You don't have to be a Zen master to get anything out of it. You can be a total beginner like me at meditation, or you can be a super experienced person like my guest today. Go to bit.ly slash mindfulness challenge 2018 to find out more or check out the show notes on the show page lstupodcast.com. Our first guest, Leanne Mayer. Remember her? Of course you do. Her new EP, Bittersweet Remedy, is out, and the launch party is November 17th at the London Music Hall of Fame Ballroom. Go to Leanne Mayer Music on Facebook for more, or once again, check out the show notes at lstupodcast.com. I think that's it for announcements. Lots of Mo Mondays coming up, lots of Toastmasters coming up, Mindfulness Challenge, and Leanne Mayer's EP release party. You want to be there. On to the show. This guy is the general manager of VRcadia, the virtual reality gaming lounge, and a 21st century polymath. He has so many talents. He's so incredibly smart. And he's one of the calmest people you will ever meet. Daniel Carlos has practiced meditation for over seven years, having gone to Japan to study it at one point. We got to discuss how meditation and virtual reality, or as he and the virtual reality community call it, extended reality, how VR and meditation are related. This guy, Daniel, is on the absolute cutting edge of VR and augmented reality. And not only that, but he is the individual that will help make this technology accessible to everybody. He's not just an academic. He can talk to anyone and take these really complicated ideas and make them accessible. The work that him and his team at VRcadia are doing, oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. I don't want to spoil it for you because guess what? We talked for like two hours about it. Isn't that neat? Don't be surprised when he gets named the Order of Canada for his contributions to virtual reality because that's going to happen one day. It is rare to talk with someone who is that smart, but yet not arrogant or impossible to understand. For more information, check out VRcadia at vrcadia.ca. That's V-R-C-A-D-I-A dot C-A. The Virtual Reality Gaming Lounge and more. 
It's not just limited to gaming, folks. Enough about that. There's so much to enjoy. Oh, and if you like meditating, sit back and relax because Mr. Daniel Carlos is going to take us through a guided meditation to start the show. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the one and only Daniel Uh, we're ready to go. Are you ready? I'm ready. You ready to rock? I am. Did you meditate before you came here? I didn't, but we. I was honestly thinking we, we should actually start this with me guiding us into a meditation. Funny that, you, funny that you say that because I was going to ask if we could do that. Perfect. Can we start off with a meditation? Yeah. Finding yourself in a comfortable position. Feeling your back straight, but not forced straight. Rolling your shoulders back, feeling your chest pop out. Allowing your eyes to close. Starting to recognize your breath at your nostril. Flowing in, flowing out. Recognizing each breath as your own. Noticing the details of the breath, the temperature of each in and each out. Taking a moment here to learn about your breath, to notice the details, to ask yourself the question, how does it feel to breathe without trying to change your breath? Simply becoming aware of the way you already breathe. With each in breath, Recognizing how that breath feels with each out breath, relaxing a little bit deeper into your body, letting go of any resistance that you might have. Recognizing your breath at your chest now. With each in-breath, your chest rises. With each out-breath, your chest falls. Seeing if you can tune in to the rhythm of your breath at your chest. You might find your mind drifts from where you'd like it to be. That's great. You're already beginning to notice where your thoughts are. See if you can follow where your mind has gone. When you found it, you found the thought, the feeling, wherever your mind is, explore it. And when you're ready to, come back to the breath. Come back to the present moment. 
to each in and out breath. Expanding your awareness further, starting to notice your abdomen. With each in-breath, your abdomen expands. With each out-breath, it contracts. Seeing if you can recognize the breath, subtly shifting your abdomen. Recognizing each in and each out. Recognizing the flow of how you breathe. Zooming out your attention, beginning to notice your body. Notice how you're supported in your posture right now. Do you have a chair, a cushion? How is your back supported? How does it feel? What about your feet? Are they placed on the ground? How do your feet feel? Recognizing any sensations that pop out to you in your body. It could be warmth, cold, tension, tiredness, energy. It could even be moisture. Allow your mind to drift to where the sensations are. To zoom in. When you feel like you've understood the sensation, detach and search for the next sensation. In this way, taking your time here to explore, what does it feel like to be you? What does your body feel like? What are you experiencing right now in this moment?
Before closing off this meditation, take a moment here to reflect on what your experience is. How did it feel to meditate? How does your mind feel after the meditation, right now? Whenever you're ready, at your own pace, come back to the room, come back to wherever you are. And open your eyes whenever you're ready. Free meditation with every podcast. <laughs> that was a great way to start things off, man. I'm glad you liked it. My question is, do we leave the bit in where my cat knocked over absolutely everything off the print? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to leave a little bit of extra silence after that, just in case you wanted to cut it out. Right. But I'll, I'll leave it to your artistic director. I would assume you'd want to cut it out because I feel like it'll be very stressful for people meditating. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a surprise. Yeah, I was amazed that you didn't react. Yeah, I, just, I looked over a little bit and went, oh, okay, well, he's just being an asshole. What else is new? <laughs> <laughs> but that's my cat. Actually, that was kind of incredible. Normally, when my cat does something like that, and by the way, this studio, yes, it has a cat. He mm -hmm. does things from time to time. And I could hear the mics picking him up in the background, walking across the desk. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment when I thought, okay, he's about to get up to something not so good. Mm -hmm. But going through that meditation, what normally would have made me feel really stressed out, right now I just feel like eh, it's a mess to clean up later. Mm -hmm. And he probably got a bit of a start. Mm -hmm. So whatever. Why stress about it? Right. One other thought I had during the meditation was, and I kept exploring a bunch of these thoughts, but one in particular was, you remind me of Jocko Willink. Wow. Except for the mind. Mm. I just got back from a workout. Mm -hmm. You basically worked out our minds here and helped us get control of emotions. Right. How long has it taken you to develop that? Yeah, that's a great question. Definitely, I'm still developing. It's still in process. I've been meditating for seven and a half ish years now and yeah it's it's it didn't come easy for me for sure so I, I think the first few years i was practicing meditation through the hindu lens so i was learning from hindu practitioners and you know at the beginning it was a lot of discipline so practicing every single day being really serious about it and then as I learned about different styles of meditation, uh, Buddhist, Zen Buddhism, um, mindfulness meditation, which was what I ended up studying academically, I kind of evolved a concept of what I would want to facilitate eventually. And then got the opportunity to start doing facilitation at the London Mindfulness Community two years ago, almost two years now. And it's been quite a journey to kind of switch my perspective to think, not just about my own personal experience, but on what other people 
want to experience with meditation and how I can start to sculpt that skill of, of using my voice as sort of a, a guidance mechanism for that process. And it, it, it take, takes a lot of practice, but now I'm getting to a point where I'm, I'm really starting to feel confident and I, I'm getting, I'm getting closer to a point where I sort of am happy to hear my, not necessarily happy to hear my, I'm okay with my voice. You know what I mean? There's this process where you, you get from like, oh, I don't like hearing my voice to it's getting a bit better to, okay, I, I see how I can modulate my voice now to do different things. And it's that, I think, experimentation with my voice that kind of has gotten me to a point where I'm feeling comfortable. We were talking just before the podcast about the idea of this failing forward and the first few experiences of anything just absolutely sucking. Right. I feel like recording your voice is a product of that. Yeah. I mean, I remember recording my first meditation thinking, geez, why does my voice sound so terrible (laughs) in every possible way? Like there's so many criticisms of the way in which I took pauses, the way in which I had inflections in my voice, the spaces I created, everything about the rhythm of my voice even was just so atrocious to me. And then you do it again and again and again, and you learn really in process of hearing your voice and and hearing where you can make those changes. I think if you don't have the mindset that it's going to take a number of trials to get something right, then you're probably going to be disappointed. I mean, there's a few people out there that are just naturals at certain things, but I feel the deeper I go into expertise in different fields... I find that that's not even necessarily the case. Like I think those who we consider to be naturals, they just fail way more gracefully than others. Like they don't even consider them failures. They consider them to be so much a part of the process. It's actually fun for them to go through those trials and tribulations to get to a point where they feel comfortable um, demonstrating it to the world. So I, I, I think it's part of it. I mean, oh, geez, it's, it's something that has rung true for me no matter what I've done I like to consider myself to be someone who generally is not a natural at almost anything (laughs) that's just been just been the case for most my life and as a result when it came to meditation I was like yeah of course this is going to be difficult at the beginning because this is this is worth worthy of it being difficult this is me trying to change the way I think trying to be comfortable sitting with my thoughts Mm. I think about my own programming experience. Mm -hmm. I started programming really not till age 16 or 17. But even then, it's taken a long time to refine that skill and get it to a point where it doesn't suck. Mm -hmm. Your point about deliberate practice, I think that's what it's called. Not 100% sure. But there's the idea of deliberate practice where you're constantly honing and refining that skill. The idea of how to practice and how to improve skills, we don't really ever cover that in school, do we? No, not at all. And I love that idea of being a natural at something. Mm -hmm. I'm assembling a speech right now for Mo Mondays. I've got, I think you heard my last one. I'm not sure. It's on YouTube now. All sex people have seen it. (laughs) But it's all about this idea of it took me a long time to figure out how I learn. Mm -hmm. I always assume that if I didn't get it right away, I was never going to get it. Mm. Like riding a bike, swimming, doing all those things. Mm -hmm. None of that came naturally. Think about swimming, though. We're not built for the water anymore. Right. How is that going to come natural when you think about it? We evolved to be hunting creatures. It's only in the last hundred years where we're not part of the food chain. It's only the last hundred years where we've really had an opportunity to be what one would call mindful. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's it's interesting too that sometimes we have such a negative perception of the learning process. You know, we feel 
you know, exactly what you said. If we don't get it at the beginning, we're deficient. But if you can just shift your perspective a little bit to include the process of failure as a part of the learning, as a part of the expectation that if I'm going to do this, which for a lot of things we, we just kind of feel like we need to do something, then we're like, okay, so part of the process of me doing this thing is going to be me failing at the beginning. And that time scale of how long it's going to take me to fail or not do well enough that I'm proud is going to vary depending on how difficult or different something is from what we're used to doing. So we were talking a little bit at the beginning about my experience of learning how to do construction, how to renovate. And I, I was going into it genuinely with little to no experience. This was something I was worried, anxious about at the beginning of the process. But it was a surprisingly growing experience for me where I was able to basically say, okay, I know for a fact I'm going to suck at this. <laughs> There's nothing in my history that tells me I'm going to be good at working with my hands. I'm going to be good at randomly learning how to create frames. I'm going to be good at drywalling. I mean, I just, these are just skills I don't have. And I have never practiced. Like there's no previous experience for me for renovations. So because I had that mindset, I was able to say, okay, I'm probably gonna have to watch a bunch of YouTube videos, how to, and I'm gonna have to break it down. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to be like, I don't know how to use a staple gun. I'm gonna watch some, some videos on how to load staples into a staple gun because it just doesn't come automatic to me. And through this process, it's been a constant ego breaking experience where I'm just thinking to myself, wow, I thought I could figure this out, but no, I actually do need to call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is not something I can just figure out. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, I, I recommend it actually. It's, I think it's, it's been great for me to, to go into a situation. I mean, Especially because before this experience of, I mean, we should probably get into some context around starting a business and, and all this kind of stuff that I'm going into right now. But before starting a business, I was basically in school for a pretty long period of time. And the experience of being in school is you're given all of the things you need to succeed. Mm -hmm. You're given this long list of resources, right? You're already given the the box, the container that... Basically, if you go enough into the container, you'll, you'll probably figure things out. Starting a business is not like that. Not at all. You're not given anything, you know, really. You create everything. You have to literally create the pathway to be able to succeed. And that is just pure hard work. So the, the expectation that you'll just be able to do things or just figure things out can't even just be there. It has to be like an expectation. I am going to fail a bunch. But that's okay. Because I want to do this so badly that I'm willing to fail until I succeed. Well, and all those failures will teach you, what did I do right? Mm -hmm. That was a huge mindset shift for me when I started to think about not necessarily what I did wrong, mm -hmm. because that's important. You need that so you can avoid bumping into sharp objects. Right. But you also need to know, what did I do right? What really worked? I think about some of my early sales calls. Oh, man, just total cringeworthy stuff. But now I know. Ask more questions. Listen more. I didn't do that at first. I always thought if I just... My original idea of sales was if I present a logical argument and break down all their objections and just show them how they're wrong and provide them with the only logical conclusion that they should buy from me, that they'll buy. Right. And I learned that while that might work on an essay in university, yeah. it doesn't work in the real world, does it? Right. No, it doesn't. And, and, and sales is a great example of it is something that you have to expect to be constantly learning about. 
Yes. Because sales doesn't stay constant because people don't stay constant. Yes. So the expectation that you'll be able to sell something in January in the same way you'll be able to sell something in April can't be the case because everything has changed. The environment that people live in, especially in Canada, from January to April, yeah, massively changed. The way in which we dress, the way in which we live our lives between January and April couldn't be more different. January, we're like preparing to be human burritos. <laughs> April, we're like, how am I getting my beach body? <laughs> right? It's like a totally different mindset of living your life. And when it comes to products or things or ideas or services or events, you've got to appeal to what's happening. You've got to understand what your community wants. And I feel like the only way to do that is to ask, like you said, as many questions as possible, to have as many conversations as possible with people who are willing to talk. And step way the hell outside your comfort zone at the same time. Right. That's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. That's a tricky one. You mentioned all sorts of different styles of meditation. I want to go back to that for a second. I know you've got, I re, I'm itching to talk about VRcadia. We'll get to that in a minute. But mm -hmm. one of the questions I had for you is the different styles of meditation. Right. For the longest time, I saw meditation as this big fuzzy umbrella that people sat still under and magic happened in their mind. I've meditated four, now five times in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed to admit that. The first ever meditation I had was just this crazy, relaxing experience. Mm -hmm. It was a guided meditation about an hour long. Wow, that's a long one. Yeah, a very long one. But I just remember feeling so focused and relaxed afterwards. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And I've never been able to replicate that experience since. Wow. I know there's all these different styles of meditation. You listed a whole bunch I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through some of those styles? What are they like? 100%. So the f meditation that we did today that sort of started off the podcast was a focus style meditation. So this is where the meditation is built around a specific, what we call an anchor. An anchor is the thing that we say, focus on this. Notice if you're not focusing on this. So in this case, we were using the breath and we we're exploring the breath in different parts of the body. So it's all focus meditation. I like to make it a little bit more exciting um, by kind of sort of moving where you connect with the breath. And then if we were to do a longer version of that, Eventually, you might even zoom out and notice all of those parts of the breath, the way you breathe. We also shift a little bit into a body scan near the end. We we're noticing how our body felt. We we're connecting with the sensations there. Body scans are similar, similarly also a focus meditation, where instead of you focusing on the breath, you focus on the sensations in the body. That's one category. And there's a lot of different ways in which we sort of split meditations, but these are what I'm talking about right now is sort of the big canopy of mindfulness meditations. Mm. The, the origin of mindfulness meditations is they're originating from mostly Zen Buddhism, but there's some other Buddhist influence there too. And it came from psychologists bringing meditation to the West. So to North America. By psychologists? By psychologists. Really? And one of those pioneering psychologists was John Kabat-Zinn. So he was a doctor um, and psychologist who was interested in how meditation might impact people who are dealing with pain. And he found through his studies that it was very effective. And so he you know, sort of brought this to the forefront. His research became very popular. And nowadays, mindfulness meditation is a big hot topic where a lot of different people are practicing. Within mindfulness meditation, we have focus meditations. We also have a whole category called loving and kindness, sometimes called gratitude meditations. And these are a lot more about exploring relationships and exploring feelings. And it's a lot around exploring abstract concepts. So you might explore the concept of gratitude, of kindness, of love, 
of your connection to other human beings, of your connection to a community, of your connection to the planet. So these are all within this category. The way they're guided, they use imagery a lot. So they'll use your heart sort of as an imagery piece where the warmth kind of grows from within you and then expands out as you connect to others. It uses the imagery of other people in your life and memories of relationships with people, sort of guide your experience of exploring feelings and connections. And this is a really beautiful, expansive practice that's really central to Buddhism. And sometimes also called meta. You'll find with meditation, there's usually like a million terms and each of the terms originates from a, from a different practice, from a different part of the world. Then there's more esoteric sort of less contained within the categories meditations. So there's the kind of stuff where, you know, if you, if you download Insight Timer, which is a free meditation app with like hundreds of thousands of guided meditations recorded, you'll find all kinds of cool stuff, um, chakra meditations and all this kind of stuff. And th these are what I like to kind of like, like, they're like specialty explorative meditations. They're the kinds of things where people are being guided through an experience. They could be focused at one point. They could be loving and kindness at other points. They could be what will be called open monitoring meditations. And open monitoring meditations are those where you're asked to label things. So feelings come up, thoughts come up. They're kind of like clouds floating along. And rather than interacting with them and feeling like you need to change them, you simply notice them arise and allow them to fade away. And notice the next thing arise. So it could be a sensation. It could be a thought. It could be a feeling. And this is a really interesting meditation too because it's really hard to just allow things to happen without interacting with it because most of the time we're used to reacting. Mm. So the idea of just sitting there and allowing yourself to notice, observe who you are as things kind of roll about is really a difficult but worthy practice because it, it literally is the practice of getting to know yourself. And it's a little bit scary too. Right. How often do we sit back and say, who am I? Yeah, and we have to be... I mean, we're pretty much, we have to be okay with the answer because that's us. Mm. And if we're not okay, there's that disconnect. And there's that, this feeling of, sometimes we call in psychology, cognitive dissonance that your thoughts don't match your expectations, right? Your behaviors. And this can be really uncomfortable, but worthy of working through. Because if we let that feeling just stay without working through and understanding why we're uncomfortable with ourselves, then that can grow into something else. That can grow into difficulties with dealing with life and dealing with who you are. So it's, I think it's something that's worth working through. And meditation is kind of a technique to explore that in a lot of ways. There's, you know, I could talk for a pretty long time academically about, about the categories, but those are really the three main ones. And then the more fun stuff on the outside is gonna be stuff like music mindfulness or dancing mindfulness or, mu or movement mindfulness. And this is really the general concept that if we can become present and aware during any behavior activity, then we can start to notice more details as they occur. So for example, if you're doing a stretch and if you, while you're stretching, notice every detail of how your muscles feel, you'll start to be able to zoom in more and more to really notice the moment of activation of that muscle the moment where it deactivates, the moment where it extends or compresses. And this can give you a really fine understanding of how your body moves. The biomechanics of your body, that's something that can be explored with a mindfulness exercise. Really? The same is true of music. If you're able to sit there and notice the what it's like for me to experience this music in every moment, when does the trumpet come in? How does that make me feel? How do the instruments interact? How does it sound to me when the instruments are separate compared to being played together? These details allow us to really tease apart amazing things within our experience. This is a general category that I like to call, it's not necessarily always called this kind of sensation meditations. These are ones where we use our different sensory parts. So it could be visual, auditory, taste, proprioception, the way in which our body moves, touch, all of this stuff, there's so much detail of information that we could be taking in, but we don't because usually we're moving from thing to thing and we kind of let the world pass us by. 
So mindfulness as an application it is often just becoming really present and aware of things as they happen. If you talk to the best athletes in the world, they'll talk about this concept of flow. This concept when they get to their peak performance, this moment where they're totally focused, they're aware of every moment, every nanosecond, that is the peak of mindfulness. That is becoming aware. Even as you know, athletes that are okay at sports, we can use mindfulness as a way to sort of in real time change our behavior. Because if we notice every single detail, we also have the most amount of moments for change. Mm. As change happens in real time. We can think about change and we can reflect on a behavior and want it to change, but the change can only really occur when it's happening. Mm. And so by being present and aware, this sort of concept of mindfulness, I am there, I'm in this moment, I am noticing these things happening to me, my experience, that's when we can really start to dive in and experience, but also change our experience, modulate it, control, optimize. Wow. Flow. I'm familiar with that from the programming community. Mm -hmm. I've heard people talk about being in flow state. Right. I'm thinking about some of the workouts I've done where I felt, I describe it as being at 100% output. Yeah. Being able to throw the bar around like it's a toy. Right. And just seeing a completely different person in the mirror. Yeah. After the track is done, I snap out of that and I come back and pant like a dog. Right. But in that moment, it feels like I can do anything and I'm 100% focused on the task at hand. Right. Would that be close to a flow state? Yeah, probably. I mean, I'd have to really measure your brain activity to know. <laughs> but at the same time, everyone has their own versions of flow state. So you talk about programming. Mm -hmm. If you talk to a jazz musician, mm. they'll talk about being in the pocket, especially jazz drummers. They'll talk about there's this moment where they're drumming. And then there's this moment where they're the music. And that's a transition. To feel at one with the moment that's occurring you're no longer thinking, am I a drummer or not a drummer? You're no longer thinking, am I doing well or not doing well? You are just doing. Ah. And so that experience of lifting, being at the gym, there's a state change. There, there really is a difference when I'm just lifting away and I'm thinking like, okay, I could lift more, I could lift less. And then there's, I am lifting. Yes, yes. And the I am lifting is getting close to that flow state, that moment of being in tune, complete with the moment as a result with your body. And as a result, being able to do more. Because there's no extra things happening. It's just the lift. It's just what you're doing at that moment, which is lifting the weights. And your whole essence is towards that moment. Everything else closes off and you're just completely focused on performing that activity. Yeah, exactly. So then the question beckons, well, how much can we do that? Yes. How do you do that all the damn time? Right. Right. I think there's a lot of ways to get there. I think musicians and my friend Joel Jacobs will often talk about, yeah, honestly, the key is drumming more. <laughs> the more comfortable you feel in that activity and the more you feel this is the essence of what you need to be doing right now, the more you can let go and just do that thing without any worries that you should be doing something else. Mm. On the other hand... I'm also of the belief that, yes, you can have expertise in something, but you can also be a generalist. You can also meditate all the time and have a really good idea of what it feels like for me to be in a state where I'm present. Becoming more and more comfortable with entering into that state by practicing either every day or it's, you know, all the time. I mean, if you, if you expect for something to be there all the time, you, you better be practicing it all the time too. It's kind of like expecting that you're going to be able to lift 100 pounds all the time, but you're really only lifting 50 pounds. Like, oh, I really want to be able to lift 100 right now. Well, if you haven't been practicing 100-pound lifts, 
then you're not going to be suddenly ready for it. It's the same idea with meditation, same idea with flow state. If you want to be able to enter flow state more often, you have to be practicing being present pretty often. And so that's where we kind of talk about the what is the, how much should I meditate? So if your goal is I want to be able to enter into a meditative flow state as often as possible, then that means you have to meditate quite a bit so that it's basically a natural state for you. It needs to become so normal for you to be meditative or to be in flow that it's just always there waiting for you. That sounds like quite the challenge. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, a lifelong challenge, actually. It's one where, you know, it doesn't really get boring to get closer to being to the present moment. Mm. I could see why that is such a profound spiritual experience for some people too. Yeah, I mean, in our classes at the London Mindfulness community, we we often get people come up to us afterwards and they say, wow, this is the first time I've noticed my body relax mm. in months or years. Right. You know, if you're living your life and your life is busy and there's a lot of things going on, and you're not intentional with taking time to reflect on what is happening, what is my life, then it, it's pretty likely you're just going to keep going. I mean, you can just keep going. There's, there's not really a urgent need to pause and reflect. And so people spend years just going, 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 going from thing to thing to thing to thing, never taking a moment mm. to just drop into the present. You know, often people love hiking for that same reason, is that they'll have a really busy life and they go into nature, they climb this mountain and they have to like really have that peak performance. Their body's working really hard. They're really going towards a goal. They get to the top of the mountain, they look over the vista and they pause. Wow, I reached it. I'm here. This is all I need right now. That presentness, that moment of awe, and if you talk to them at that moment, they're like feeling pretty good. <laughs> so then to me, it's a question of, you know, how much can I spend my time teaching people to enter into that state, to, to be able to be present, um, even if it's just once a week, ideally once a day, but you're getting closer and closer. And at least you're having those moments of recognition that there is another way to live. Mm. When you're talking about going inwards, or just reflecting on your life, I think back to many times where people's first time doing that is when some tragedy strikes or when some major calamity comes down in their life. Right, where you have to reevaluate. Yeah. What is my life? And that feels like a really bad time to do that. You know, we don't really choose these things. So there's like, you know, to reflect on something to say good or bad, mm -hmm. I would say that's, that's maybe not the best perspective to have on it. I think you get things as they come, right? I mean, if a terrible thing happens to you and it causes you to pause and to reflect what is my life, that's exactly when it happens. And from there, it's just a question of, of, you know, where can you reach to explore that thing? As opposed to, I feel like I need to explore this thing and then you just keep going. Right. So to take that moment of difficulty, of suffering, of this is a terrible thing that happened to you but to use it to explore yourself your life the things you want your purpose that's an amazing thing right that's an amazing thing to take this this moment and like totally turn it around and just be like wow i actually learned something massive about myself it's a hard thing to learn but i'm learning i'm moving in a direction where there's more to discover about myself mm. and an opportunity to live up to your own potential that's right Wow. All the different styles of meditation. I almost said hypnosis mm -hmm. because something I kept thinking about as you were going through some of those styles and some of the language around meditation, it feels like there's a slight crossover with the field of hypnosis. For sure. And 
if you look at the psychological research, there definitely is some crossovers. I think in some circles, meditation has often has sometimes been referred to as self hypnosis. The idea that if I want to reach a state or I want to reach presentness, I can do something that gets me there. Sort of similar to the idea of hypnosis, right? The idea that if you do something or you let someone cause an experience on you, then you'll be sort of within a state. And that state, hypnosis, is one where maybe you're a little bit more open, where you're a little bit more willing to um, answer questions, where you're willing to go deeper into a trauma, for example, which is often how hypnosis is used in, in clinical therapy. I mean, I think we, I think it's important to define what hypnosis actually is as opposed to what we often see it as from magicians using it. Yeah, let's define that very somewhat rigorously. Yeah, and I'm no hypnosis expert in any way, shape, or form. Um, sort of seen it through conferences and, and different clinicians using it in their practice. One of my supervisors used it often in his therapy. So the way it, it works, it's interesting. So first of all, people vary in how hypnotic they can be. There's an actual self-report scale. If you fill it out, it's, it's very accurate and stable that people, you know, they, they may be more likely to be easily falling into hypnosis when someone, you know, causes it, or they may be very unlikely to fall into it. And those people, you know, it doesn't even make sense to use hypnosis on them. It's too much effort. Mm. I won't go into too much detail of, of what varies that thing. It's a bunch of personality traits, a bunch of, you know, factors in someone's life. For those who are amenable to hypnosis, the experience is, is very much one where, you know, you're suddenly very open, right? You're very open to conversations, to questions. Your barriers, this sort of, the sort of reflective mind that's constantly like, should I say this or should I not say this or what should I say in this is, is, is often, you know, sort of put at bay. And you're in this state where you're conversationally able to talk about things that would normally be very difficult. So it's, it's quite helpful in trauma therapy where often there's huge expanses of topics that are very difficult to dive into because they have some sort of connection with a trauma. And so being able to slowly kind of go through these things one by one in that sort of hypnotic state can be helpful. And they can allow that sort of moment of reorganization of thinking and to review something that would otherwise be very difficult to get into. That's how it's often used kind of in clinical therapy um, I think magicians, you know, sort of use it in a very different way where they where they sort of put people into a state where they're, you know, can't remember things and they go into sort of this. So I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with that sort of level of it. I think there's definitely, there are obviously similar techniques of how you induce people into it. Um, but, you know, th so that's hypnosis. And its similarity to meditation is, is definitely, there's, there, there's sort of similar state changes, but different because you're in control. Mm. So even though someone's guiding you through the experience and sometimes it can feel almost hypnotic, their voice, it's not really meant to force you into any states. Like your body won't just shift into a meditation that easily. Actually, in fact, there's usually a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have to actually sit there and suffer through your mind being distracted, going all over the place, not really listening to the instructions of what you want it to do. And that's itself the meditation. The becoming comfortable with the thoughts that arise, realizing that, oh, I am actually distracted by a lot of things, right? There's a law going on. Maybe I need to pause and take some time to notice these things and what's actually happening in my mind, sort of clearing of, you know, everything that's going on. And, and to, you know, you know, to clean your room, you actually have to go and organize the whole room. You can't just be like, I want my room to be clean. You snap your fingers and the room is clean. So in the same way in meditation, we don't say clear your mind, Right. Because that's not something people can just snap their fingers and do. Rather, it's about the exploration and the observation of your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, the what is going on, and looking at it with fresh eyes that makes all the difference. So in that way, hypnosis and meditation is the same, right? It's this sort of idea of I'm going to work on something that allows me to have a new perspective. And that new perspective with meditation is being present. So it's and realistically, if you're present, right, you're not seeing some fabricated story. You're seeing the absolute truth because the truth unfolds in real time, mm. every moment by moment by moment. Now we have this sort of biased lens that kind of like tinges everything based on what we want to see. But the deeper we go into mindfulness, into meditation, 
the less we can tinge things because we don't have the time to do it because we're in the moment. So we are just seeing it as it is. And so in that way, it is sort of the self, self-hypnosis of I'm entering into a state where all I'm seeing is the truth, where all I'm seeing is the moment-by-moment moment unfolding of reality. That will probably scare some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think... I think in in general, there's there's almost like a depth to it, where you know you can be at the surface. Okay, like I'm ready to look at the what it's like to be focused on pain in my body, mm. or just sensations in my body. What does it feel like for me to sit upright, as mm. opposed to my normal posture might not be sitting upright. And then you can go deeper, and you can say, what are the kinds of thoughts that I have. Because you might have a perception, I have only intelligent thoughts, or I have thoughts that are only what I would label as good. But in fact, if you meditate, you realize that most people are capable of having terrible, ter- what we would organize as terrible, terrible thoughts, and the stupidest possible thoughts. What we'd organize as stupid as possible, because reality is they're just thoughts are thoughts. They don't really have a sort of schema of whether they're good or bad or <laughs> you know, that's how we organize it later on, right? Right. So that's what we kind of label the thoughts. Um, so, you know, going deeper and deeper into our thoughts, they reveal the layers of reality. They, they, they reveal the layers of who we are. Mm. And you may not be prepared for that. And that's okay. Like, it, it, it's going to take time for you to be prepared for it. That's why it's worth starting practice now. Because it, it's probably, like I said, it's a lifelong practice. And it doesn't necessarily work in a straight path right? You may think like, this is often an ego thing that comes up for meditators. They're thinking, all right, I'm becoming pretty good at this. (laughs) I can sit nicely with my mind. And then they have the craziest thoughts. And they're like, I can't sit with my mind. I'm a psychopath. (laughs) And it feels like starting from scratch because you weren't prepared for what reality was. And so you have to go back to the beginning but at the same time, you're pe- peeling away the layers of this sort of world you've created, this perception, this bias of yourself. And so it's a worthy practice to slowly peel away at those layers because you're never really starting from the beginning. You're always progressing forward, but you have no way of knowing what that progress meter is. You don't know how fast your will progress. You don't know how fast you're going to progress. All you can do is think every day I'm going to move forwards. And forwards, really, in this case, just means doing. So to meditate is to progress. In this sort of scenario of like the what it's like to be a meditator who's constantly meditating. Sure. I never thought I would hear the idea of meditation and ego in the same sentence. (laughs) Somebody being an egotistical meditator. Of oh, mind. oh, yeah. It's a big part of it's a big part of the wellness community. It's a conversation that we often have is is when you meet a facilitator or someone who's been doing it for a long time, but they feel they're an expert. They've forgotten the concept of beginner's mind, which is that every time you realize you think you are good enough at something, you realize there's an infinite amount of things you have to learn. So it's, it's, it's an important lesson to constantly re- revisit because you should notice that you're getting better. But what is the best you can be is an unknown. Mm. What's the limit of your potential? Yeah. Ideally limitless. Yeah. Which I believe. Right. I think there's, in terms of human potential, anybody can be anything. I know that sounds highfalutin and all that, but I, I believe that. I think we can be anything, but we shouldn't necessarily aim to be anything. Right. Because we may just find it drives us crazy to try to become good at something you know, for example, someone who doesn't really have a passion for golf, mm. they could probably become good at golf eventually, but should they be the person who puts in 10,000 hours into golfing if they don't have an actual joy or passion for golfing? I don't think so. I, I think it's okay to focus on becoming, you know, becoming better at things that give you joy and give you happiness. Some things we'll have to become better at that don't give us those things. Um, like I'm experiencing with renovations. Yes. There's definitely a joy with completing renovations. But, you know, do I really get excited about the idea of getting better at 
creating ceiling tiles? Not really. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd rather be spending time meditating or, or, or exploring virtual reality. It's not necessarily at the top of my list of things I want to become an expert in. But there's still a joy to be found in, in getting better at those things because I, I need to get better at them. Right. But they're more means to an end for you. Right. Interesting. That might give us a good transition into your virtual experience work. Yeah. Into VRcadia. Yeah. Because you're right in the middle of launching this incredible, groundbreaking business. Well, thank you for describing it that way. Right in the middle of downtown London. I drove past it the other day. I saw your sign out front and I went, mm -hmm. oh, it's happening. It's finally happening. It's finally happening. It's gone from, when did we first meet? I feel like it was at the Millennial Network Group. Yeah, it was definitely at the Millennial Network Group. Um, I want to say at the beginning of the summer. So around May, I think that's when I started going. Yes. Cody was still running it at that point. Yep. That was that was not this summer though. It was last summer, wasn't it? Really? I feel like it was this summer. I don't know. Time is a little bit of a weird thing when you're an entrepreneur. The last two years are kind of a big blurry sandwich right now. For me as well. I could be completely wrong about that. I, I think it's this summer only because I really only started to get deep into the London entrepreneurship, like entrepreneur community over the last year. Maybe. I could see that. It might have been early in the summer, too. We had an incredibly long, hot summer that started early. Yeah. It could have been April, May or June or yeah, something Yeah, March like or even. <laughs> you might be right. For me, 2017 didn't really stop. Right. Do you get that feeling, too? Oh, definitely. 2017 started and then just kept going? Yeah. I'm in denial that we're in 2018. Yeah, and it's almost 2019. Oh, God. That's scary. <laughs> That's absolutely scary. Back to the point. You're in the middle of launching VRcadia, and That's that right. has come out of your work and research in virtual reality and passion, too. Yeah, and definitely more passion than research in the sense that my research academic career was always around meditation and creating personalization in that field so how we what things we should measure to understand how we can personalize meditation programs and my transition into virtual reality was actually as a result of two things one i've always loved the progression of technology i've always kept up with every little update that comes out with smartphones or laptops doing that for as long as i can remember just always excited at the new thing that's coming out in in collaboration with knowing all the technologies around meditation so the, the, my sort of subfield within meditation was always around the things we measure and the things we measure means the tools we use to measure them. So that's, that could be brain measuring tools like EEG machines or fMRI machines, or they could be heart rate measurements, understanding heart rate variability and what that means for when people are going through meditation. All of these tools were also in relation to things like apps that were coming on smartphones that were facilitating and guiding meditation. And I think the sort of technological support of wellness has always been really important and interesting to me. So when virtual reality started to come back into vogue with the Oculus during that Kickstarter campaign um, a few years back, I was already very excited about virtual reality from a anime sort of perspective of kind of seeing Sword Art Online and, and the sort of technology and also knowing about the technology since I was a kid. I mean, for us, we were growing up in a point where virtual reality was still sort of science fiction, but it, we knew it existed somewhere in the world, but it was like a research tool. It was like something that you would just see on TV randomly, almost like a part of robotics yes. that we didn't necessarily see as a part of our society yet. And then when the Oculus Kickstarter campaign came out, we were like, whoa, even the, I, I would say the whole technology community was pretty much excited at this sort of possibility of technology suddenly transitioning to our faces. Yes. From something that we were interacting with to something we were inside of. That was the sort of promise of virtual reality. And when that started happening, I was kind of keeping track of it. And then within the post-traumatic stress um, disorder sort of research field, which is where I really started before meditation, I was actually studying stress and all the sort of levels of stress from you know, meditation, which is sort of stress relief, all the way to post-traumatic stress disorder, sort of the most extreme 
impact of stress on someone. And in post-traumatic stress disorder, virtual reality has actually been a part of training resilience for soldiers for a long time, for, for over 20 years. 20 and, years? That's right. What? And I'm not going to say it's the most high end of experiences back then, but when I would go to conferences, virtual reality would be there. And so at the same time as sort of seeing um, brain sensing headbands coming out, the virtual reality technology was also getting better and better in, in the mental health field. And so I, I had seen it coming for a little bit. And then I got this opportunity to um, to work on a virtual reality meditation project through happenstance of, of meeting um, people working at uh, in a sort of uh, research department, like R&D department of this company called MedTech. And so we developed this uh, virtual reality meditation there. It was like a one-year project. It was, it was almost like a startup within a large company. The idea being, you know, let's, let's create this demo and let's do a sort of market analysis and see what is this field going to be like. Let's run a little bit of research here and there, um, maybe even start to look at the, what it would be like for us to develop multiple projects. And although that project, we developed the virtual reality meditation, it didn't lead to many other projects like we were kind of hoping. It opened me up to the entire field. And through it, I had to understand how do you develop virtual reality? How do you go from an idea to a storyboard to a video game design? So I had to learn about Unity and Unreal Engine and all this sort of backbone to developing virtual reality experiences. I learned about the Oculus and the HTC Vive and the technology, the hardware that goes with it. Because when you're creating software, you need to understand what's possible with the hardware. Yes. And through all of that, I started envisioning myself in that field. And I started to understand you know, what it was that I loved so much about this technology, what it could be right? It's sort of future thinking process of being like, what is the future going to be like? Mm -hmm. And then I went to Japan and I saw what the future was going to be for us. I saw the virtual reality arcades. I saw the virtual reality theme parks. I experienced so many things because, you know, Japan is this mecca of technology where society is much more willing and accepting of new technologies. In fact, they're more excited they want these new technologies to exist. Yes. And so I, I went to Japan on this sort of spiritual journey of wanting to explore Zen Buddhism to understand it from where it originated. Well, where it sort of grew, because it actually, Zen Buddhism originated in China and then um, grew and sort of became something else in Japan. So I went there to study Zen Buddhism and also travel and experience anime and just dive really deep into Japanese culture. I mean, I even love things like gardens and all this kind of wonderful stuff. Sushi is my favorite food. So it was a trip that I had planned for many years. And obviously at that point, virtual reality was at the tip of my head. So I went and I sort of saw what it was going to be like. And I, I came back to London and I said, I've got to be in this industry. At the time, I understood that the industry didn't really exist in London. There's only a few companies here and there that were starting up that were really starting to experiment with it. And then... So as a result, we realized we wanted to make a place, a location where people could come and experience and understand what was coming, what was virtual reality going to be. And now when was this? This would be May of 2017. And um, developed out the idea by August and... Since then, we've been working full steam to have a location to to open up, to have a place where people can try it. And now we're getting really close to that point of fruition. You know, you, you dream for so long and you put in all the sweat and tears and then it gets to this sort of pinnacle where now you're just hardworking. <laughs> now yeah. you're just every day waking up, you know exactly what you need to do to get to that point and you just do it. You're grinding. We're in that grind. Yes. So we're grinding really hard to open up as soon as we can. Um, and so that's looking closer and closer. And I think, um, I can get sort of confident in saying we're going to be opening sooner rather than later. And we're sort of within that window of, of two ish months of being grand opening, kind of open for business. And we're already in that sort of testing phase now where we're starting to bring in the tech full steam and, and, and really test out how our location works with the tech. When you do your grand opening, 
are folks at home going to be able to join in the experience with their virtual reality headsets? Wouldn't that be cool for a launch? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I don't know how we would do that. I mean, I, I guess what you're asking is whether we can live stream it in 360. Well, that's what I just got out of my suitcase here is that Insta360 Air. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I do actually have an Insta360 as well. You've got the better one. This thing's just a piece of crap compared. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's always a better one. <laughs> it's a real way to, to see the tech. But yeah, I think I think we'll definitely be doing experimenting a lot with um, with 360 cameras and, and the what it's like to to live stream. I'm I'm really excited to just find out um, what people want to experience. Um, a big part of this business is going to be how do we connect with the community? How do we find out what each person in London wants virtual reality to be for them? Mm hmm and sort of ex go on that exploration with those people. Because that's that's what this is all about. It's not really about what I think virtual reality is going to be. It's about what the community wants virtual reality to be. And it's about London taking a confident step forwards with this technology, Yes. with exploring what it can be, what it can change. What does art look like with virtual reality? What does historical reviews look like what does education look like with virtual reality what does scientific experimentation psychological experimentation what do all of these things look like when we explore what does wellness look like with virtual reality as our way to create wellness experiences that are beautiful and amazing did you ever use the oculus with second life no, I haven't experienced Second Life with the Oculus, but there is a lot of similar experiences to Second Life that are specifically made for virtual reality. So things like Sensar and High Fidelity, which are pretty amazing experiences of, of having your own avatar and walking around having, you know, sort of locomotion in the experience, walking around streets that people have created. Uh, um, so we just started kind of exploring these kinds of things, which are really awesome. That transformed the way that I thought about virtual reality. Mm. The first time that I went online with the Oculus headset, this was the DK2, I think. Because mm -hmm. they had the first version, then they released the second one. That's the one that I bought. Right. I went online on a whim to my old Second Life account, walking around and doing live chat with friends. And I had my headset in, so it was the full immersive experience. Right. What was really crazy about it is how close it was to what I would call a real world experience of hanging out with friends. Because by that point, they had also included, there was a bit of spatial audio. Right. I don't have the right words for it. but That's the right word. Yeah. You could more or less tell where somebody was based on the way the audio was tweaked. Yeah, localized sound. Yeah, localized sound. Thank you. That was, when I went through that experience, I thought this is huge this and it was so there were some experiences where i was just i had to walk away from the computer for a little while because i went okay that was too weird that i felt way it felt like reality there were moments where i was in this virtual environment and went that felt real that felt about as real as it gets i think it's it's so important that this technology, virtual reality, is more about how do we connect in a new world? Yes. And less about how do we isolate ourselves from the real world? I think social virtual reality is actually one of the most exciting things happening. To spend some time in something like Rec Room or Alt Space VR, which are these experiences where there's all these different rooms that people can create and morph around and then you can come with people from all over the world to hang out in this place and to have real-time conversations with facial expression changes i mean first time experienced facebook spaces um i think they also call it yeah i think it's called facebook spaces it's this experience where your avatar is built from your photos on facebook Wow. And then you have, you know, I mean, they're still building it out. So it's not this sort of like amazing, expansive Skyrim sort of experience. But what it is instead is this real interactive element where you can be in virtual reality. Someone on their laptop can go on video in Messenger and their, their video can come up in virtual reality 
and you come up as your avatar in their video. And so there's all these cross pollinations between the virtual world and the real world, all connected in on the internet, sort of this connectome of social experiences. I think our world is moving past this idea of, is it a real social experience if we're not having it in person? Right. I think we're way beyond that for so many reasons. Like trying to to keep um, a serious, you know, into this conversation. Well, Zach the cat <laughs> is 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 in my in my lap. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's amazing about virtual experiences is that they, you know, they are that. They're these virtual social experiences where we feel present in the moment. I mean, we talk about um, sort of the concept of the what it's like to be mindful, right? Mm-hmm. Well, when you put on a VR headset, you're the most mindful you can be because there's nothing else but you in that experience. But I said, I just had a thought about this. Yeah. We are talking about the idea of it has to be in the real world for it to be a real experience or for it to be a legitimate social experience that it's if it's in a virtual reality world it's somehow a virtual experience for somebody who maybe they're completely immobilized maybe that's it like what makes the experience virtual or artificial in some way if we are experiencing it so it we're we're looking at our eyes might be limited to looking at some sort of an LCD screen and a headset, but what makes that not real? I think the term that we often use in the industry for people who are really into the field is extended reality. Ah. The idea that we have the things we can do normally in the world, and then there's what we can do with these added tools. Augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. These are all ways in which to experience more than what we have. Mm. It's an extension. And how we use it, of course, is based on the individual. But for the accessibility community, for example, we talk about how virtual reality can be a tool for people to experience worlds that they just can't experience for whatever reason, whether you are just have too much difficulty to travel So traveling, going on a plane and flying somewhere is not an option for you right now. Well, going into virtual reality and going and experiencing Rome, why is that not a legitimate experience? Mm -hmm. That is a legitimate experience. You're there, you're experiencing this simulation of Rome that gets better and better each time I go into Google Earth VR. Yes. And... You know, that's important. That's important for people to be able to experience. I mean, this is why this technology exists. It's so that we're able to do more, so that we're able to experience more. So we're able to, like, like, like I said, the term, extend our reality beyond what we think is possible. You know who I was thinking of talking about mobili- mobility issues? When you were talking about all these virtual experiences, Stephen Hawking, Mm. somebody like him, who's almost completely locked in, who was, he's no longer around, which is sad. Somebody like that who, if he wasn't Stephen Hawking, let's face it, wouldn't have a lot of options for travel. Right. And the ability that, that extended reality, I'd never thought, I've never heard of that term and now that you're, mentioned it it makes me think back to the early days of my having a laptop because i've got yeah uh, because i've got cerebral palsy Mm. one of my early accommodations was and this was back in the early 90s i was supposed to have a laptop computer right handwriting is really slow and awkward and painful for me Mm -hmm. i got to a point where i could not memorize everything that was being said the cognitive load was too high. The laptop, for me, became more than just a tool. It became, I always refer to it as an extension. Right. That was an extension of me. Right. 
I never went anywhere without it. It was because of that laptop that I was able to get ideas from my brain onto some other medium so I could express them with the world. Right. It was, to me, what a pacemaker would be to, to somebody else who has heart issues. Right. It's something that I simply cannot exist without, effectively. Right. And, and I think it's so important the way you're describing this too because the reason why technologies often develop is out of a need. Yes. Out of something that we need to exist. That's how engineers think. Yes. So when I think of the most well-designed technologies, they're the ones that feel like an extension of ourselves. The best designed stylus should feel like a pen, mm -hmm. but able to do more than a pen. Mm -hmm. That's why we need it. So that we can write onto a screen that corrects our handwriting. Yes. So that those who have bad handwriting, or for those who are, like you were describing, have a difficulty writing the way in which other people want them to write. Mm -hmm. The stylus was a tool that allowed that to occur. Not to mention, it meant we didn't have to worry about paper. Yes. So it's such an important technology because of so many things. Virtual reality, augmented reality, any of these technologies, they're extensions of what we're able to do in our normal life. A good example, which I love that I'm seeing, is the fitness virtual reality community. There's this beautiful niche community growing of people who are re-exploring what it means to exercise. Virtual reality technology where you're tracking your hands, you're tracking your head movement in six degrees of freedom. When we talk about the HTC Vive experience or the Windows um, MR experiences. So with these technologies, what you're able to do is play something like a boxing game. Ah. Where you have the headset on, you're seeing an opponent who's coming towards you. You have your hands up feels like they're about to punch you, so you better punch them back. Or you might be doing some boxing training. You might be working out, but your experience is playing a game. What could be better for a generation of people who fell in love with video games, who fell in love with the idea of sitting on a couch, interacting with this experience? Well, now it's even more that experience. Now you're standing up, you're in it. You're actually active during that experience. That's one of the most beautiful things is it bridges this sort of gap, this sort of issue that we have between generations where one generation looks down on another generation. You know, the generation of thinking, why are you wasting your time in these video games? You should be living your life and getting better. And then the other generation thinking, I am, I'm playing these experiences that matter to me. They expand my creativity. They expand my relation to the world. They allow me to see more things than just what is reality. I can imagine more than that fantasy. I can live there. Virtual reality bridges that gap because it shows, okay, listen, I'm not just sitting here and doing this thing. I'm experiencing these things. It's beyond me just playing a game. I am in this game. Not only that, but there's applications to the real world. So I'm playing a racing game. Well, this racing game is so accurate now where the steering wheel is real. The pedals are real. I am in the seat. I'm learning to drive. Yeah, that's how I learned to do stick shift. Literally, was with a copy of Forza and my Xbox 360 and the pedals. Right. I learned how to drive stick manual through a video game. That's right. And another idea that just crossed my mind, I haven't thought about this one probably in 11 years. Back, way back when I played Second Life a hell of a lot, I remember at one point thinking... I was at this, the scene was I was at some sort of social club and we were all interacting and the thought crossed my mind of, I'm practicing for the real world. Mm. That's what the interactions were like. Right. It was, when can I jump into the conversation? When's appropriate? How long do I let this person talk? How long do I let that person talk? How long should I talk for? Right. And sometimes, especially when you're a kid, you don't always get that opportunity to practice Right. especially in a setting where it doesn't matter, let's say. For adults, we have Toastmasters. Right. Now, that's going to be really fascinating to see virtual reality plus public speaking. They just uh, released this experience. I forgot the name of it, 
where it tracks where you're looking in the room and yeah. gives you real time recommendations when you switch, move your gaze. And then it gives you a score based on how your head movement was, based on how you were holding your body, based on the words, the pauses, everything. It's tracking everything in real time. These are the kinds of things that are really hard to give people feedback on. Yeah. Because it's hard to take in that information. You usually give people like very general advice about public speaking. You might give them, you know, some examples of ways to write speeches or how they should pause. But to give someone real-time feedback of where their gaze is, how they're interacting with the audience, that's something that I'm not sure we've really had a good way of doing before this. This is going to dramatically change how fast people get better at public speaking. Holy shit, you're right. Whoa. And as a Toastmaster, I feel like now I've got a duty to help bring this to the rest of the speaking world. Can't wait to help you. That's crazy. I never thought of that application. Because in that environment, you can figure out very easily where your gaze is directed, some of the body movement. And funny enough, on a related topic, I was thinking about my going back to exercise, my form. Right. When I exercise. So doing push ups or doing a plank. If you do them incorrectly, you can kind of screw with your lower back and get some lower back pain. Right. And eventually, who knows what happens? Your discs turn into donuts or something. I've yummy no donuts or uh probably not good to have your discs turn into donuts. I, was... I some somebody called them jelly donuts. Wow. Yeah. Actually, I think it was someone on Facebook that actually had a broken back or something. It wasn't Greg. It was somebody else. Hmm. What I was thinking just now is with virtual reality, is there an avenue to give instant feedback about what's your form like? Like if you're going through a push-up exercise, are you on target? Is there some way that you can improve? Um, I can definitely imagine the technology that would be needed for that. Mm-hmm. I think at that point we're talking about wearing something like a, a jacket of sort of some sort that's being tracked. That kind of notices your form, the way your back is, the way your chest is, the way your arms are. The other option is to have a sort of camera that's sort of watching and analyzing in real time using machine learning, sort of understand your body posture. Kind of like the connect. Yes. So I think that kind of stuff is definitely possible. I mean, just the way in which VR is, I mean, it's just about tracking points. Right. How many things are we tracking and what can we learn from those things that track? So for public speaking, the most important things have nothing to do with our upper body or our lower body. It's almost all our head and the way in which our gaze is, the way in which we're looking, where we're looking, and how we're speaking, our voice. Those things are all tracked right now and how virtual reality is already done. So the HTC Vive, for example, tracks your hands. So what you're doing with your hands is important for when you're speaking. Yes. It also tracks your head, where your head is in space, where it's looking. And the newer VR headsets that are coming out over the next year are going to actually track your eyes, where your eyes are looking. The reason why we track your eyes in the newer headsets is so that we're able to give higher end visual experiences because where our focus is, is the only place that matters of, in terms of focusing image. Right. So we can do this thing called foveated rendering, which is this really amazing technology that I could nerd out on. But it's basically going to be this software way in which we cut like optimize a visual experience to be at its peak in just one really specific area that moves based on where our focus is so that we don't overtax our computers trying to push like 5k visuals on each eye which is too much for our current computing ability i was just about to say wouldn't that also solve a problem with virtual reality headsets where one of my earliest complaints when I wore the Oculus was I felt like my eye was trying to, when I'd look in the distance, I felt my eye trying to shift focus, but it wouldn't like, it was just like going in and out of focus. I've got bad eyes anyway. Yep. So the early Oculus stuff didn't really work that well for me. Yep. There were moments where it was completely real and awesome and it worked perfect. Yep. But for the most part, I was always, I've never quite focused in, never quite dialed in. 
would that solve that problem? Um, that's pupillary distance. So okay. it's the way in which the lenses themselves are placed. Um, so you, for in the HTC Vive, for example, you have a little knob that kind of changes the distance between the lenses. And that should be ideally, especially people with, uh, with uh, anybody should spend the time to sort of adjust that because um, that makes all the difference for how the two images are focused. Now you're right in that foveated rendering actually does, like that's a, that's a smart insight you're making there, does change some of that. And there's actually another technology that's being kind of developed at the same time, I forget what it's called, but it's basically the idea of, of being able to focus things a little bit differently so that you have depth a little bit more in virtual reality. Generally though, I'd say that problem has already gone a lot better since the DK2. Like the HSC Vive Pros, which we use at VR Arcadia, um, I haven't really had anybody complain on that because the lenses just have increased in quality. Wow. And the actual software itself recognize, like software developers recognize that, and so they've updated things quite a bit. And they've also expanded the size of the actual like space in, so you can bring your glasses inside the headset. Oh, thank God. So that wearing your, your glasses is a part of it. I mean, it's a choice always, yes. whether you want to wear your glasses or not. Some, some people really need them, some people don't. But if you're constantly looking into the distance in virtual reality and you have an issue with looking at the distance for focus, then wearing your glasses can really help. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's good news that I can wear my glasses with the headsets now. Thanks for letting me nerd out a little bit there. No, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so cool that they're solving that. So with VRcadia, we've been talking a lot about virtual reality. You had briefly mentioned augmented reality. Where's that going in your professional opinion? So let me make some predictions. These are not meant to be an expert opinion. <laughs> I'm no yes, expert in augmented reality. You are an expert on extended reality, my friend. I'm definitely a lover of the technology. I think where we're going to be today for one more year or a couple more years is that our smartphone cameras are going to get better and better. I think the, the newest iPhones are, are great demonstrations of that. Have you seen the LG V40? Yeah, it's another great example. They put five cameras in that thing. It's crazy. So what that's allowing us to do now is that we our cameras are now able to see depth. Yes. So they're able to see when objects are placed on a table and they're able to see where on that table. They're able to see the distance of that object between us. And so we can do pretty good augmented reality just on our phones, just holding our phones. Now, nobody really wants to hold a technology in front of them to do the experience of augmented reality. I mean, it's something that's in, it's an in-between step. It's what happens when we have a new technology, a new option. We don't want to invest in new hardware yet because the new hardware hasn't gotten to a point where it's sexy enough. But yet people are okay with holding their phones in front of them at a concert. Right. So that's why augmented reality will will work and it's going to get more and more exciting. I think now we're seeing like games pop out on the mobile app store that are using augmented reality, which are really awesome. And I'm having a few friends who are just getting obsessed with the sort of memes and GIFs that you can create when you just throw in like a really hilarious GIF into an experience of a video. Yes. So we're going to play a lot around with that. But I think the real exciting pieces are when, when we get glasses that are really nicely designed. I think we're starting to see computing change as a result. Mm. One good example is a Canadian company that just announced that they're releasing the Focals. And the Focals are a very simple concept. Let's not worry about having the best possible augmented reality. Let's worry about making the best designed glasses we can. So rather than trying to introduce people to the absolute peak of technology, which we can do amazing things with augmented reality, like the HoloLens is a great example the Magic Leap glasses that just came out can do really amazing things with mapping an entire environment, saving the way in which we map a room, placing objects in that room that interact with each other, that interact with you, that have movement, that have personality, that have like been beautifully recorded and created. You can play amazing games. Now, it's also like $3,000. Yeah. And there's not that many games and experiences made for it yet because it's new. Not going to be under many Christmas trees. Not yet. But we're pretty much, I would say, in the first two years of development of augmented reality. Even though the HoloLens has been out for a while, it didn't really, I think, catch on in, a, in the way that they were hoping in the development community. I think we're still just get, picking up steam with developers seeing it as a real technology to 
to to work on. Can I throw out a hypothesis here? Yeah. From having done some research in the augmented reality space last year specifically, the one thing that struck me about a lot of the augmented reality kits out there, let's say, yeah. is I experimented with Blipar, Erasma, a couple of other ones, and then a little bit of AR kit. I think Microsoft's as well. Yeah. There was a whole bunch that I experimented with. The one thing that struck me was it's just like any other early emerging technology where you had to be this in this magical sweet spot where not only were you creative, you knew how to write very low level code. Yeah. The and you had to support very specific devices. We should define low level in this case to be efficient. Sure. But I mean simple and efficient. Yeah, simple and efficient. Plus, you had to be able to do some pretty crazy maths because the de- Interesting. the development tools just completely sucked. Right. Like it was like import your model from 3ds Max. Yep. Here you go. Yep. Now it's up to you to do all the transform math based on the angle that the device gives you back. Have fun. There you go. And I think one of the things I haven't tried. I'm not a developer in AR. I sort of want to be. I'm a little bit jealous. Magic Leap seems to be, from what I've heard, early signs that they're trying to change that. Yes. And I think AR Kit, correct me if I'm wrong, has evolved a lot since it first came out. And it's trying to give a little little bit more tools to developers and also a lot more tutorials and trainings on, on how to design nice experiences. I think the key, and you, and you sort of touched on it, to any technology getting amazing and exciting and tantalizing for the public to use is around how the developers become comfortable with their creativity in that platform. Yes. A great example is, if you remember the first apps that came out on smartphones, they were just computer games, simplified. Or a way to make fart noises. Right. And it wasn't until we or the developer community really started to see why the technologies in the smartphones can be used in cooler ways than technologies in the laptops or in the you know computers that apps really started to become amazing mm-hmm. you know using accelerometers and gyroscopes to be able to make amazing experiences like i mean i remember the first time i played a driving game where I had side to side movement for moving the car. I was like, Oh my God, this is so immersive. That was just on a little screen. Yeah. Augmented reality is in its really early stages, but where I see it going is that as things like focals, which is by this, this company that just rebranded, they used to be called Thalamic labs and they made this thing called the Mayo band, which was they're from Waterloo. Yeah. They sound super familiar. Yeah, they're very familiar. I feel like the tech community's always been excited about them. Oh, yeah. The Mayo Band was this really cool band that uh, looked at your muscular movement in your arm. So you could do different, like, basically flexes of your forearm to actually interact with a touchscreen. So to actually do functions on an iPad. And their idea was creating a new interface for using technology. And they were successful to a certain degree. And then they rebranded to create these really recent news, to create these focals. And the concept of the focals is custom eyewear that looks good slightly thicker than regular eyewear that has very basic augmented reality features the idea being let's get people comfortable with augmented reality and how it can fit into their lives so that we can design the next generation of augmented reality this is a huge leap in technology i mean we're going from having to pick something out of our pocket to information always being available in front of our eyes. And, and that's we've, not a small leap. And we we the intermediate to that is the smartwatches. Smartwatches and also projecting displays. Yes. So where we too. where we see sort of like you know a clock projected on a wall or a um you know sort of experience of going into like an art experience where there's just the walls have been basically like projected amazing animations and that experience of kind of watching the animation move. Yes. That sort of experience is like, whoa, I could see that as like an artistic tool of how I design a house 
I don't have to paint anything. I just project something on the wall. So that's been, that's been around. And augmented reality is an extension of that where we can have any information that we would normally have or any more things than that, things we can't even imagine right now. And also all of the data of our, that's powering in our smartphone. Yes. Or whatever compute device we're using to run that experience. So it could be eye gaze in the glasses that you're wearing. So as your eye gaze is being tracked, the augmented reality experience actually reacts to it. So one amazing, super cool, like it's kind of blew my mind. Experience that I saw that was just shown at the developer conference for Magic Leap was this AI character. And the way she looked and functioned in the videos, I didn't go to this conference, so I can't speak to what the real life experience is, but just watching the video of it, she looked you in the eyes and her eyes were very alive, very there. And they were reacting to how your eyes move. Whoa. And because that AI has that information of the real time eye movement, the connection seems very real. Because what's more real than connecting eye to eye? Nothing. Normally, you don't even see eyes with robots, right? Because if it's looking in the wrong direction, it just looks weird. We could have had eyes in all these robots, but what's the point? Sure. Now with AI, having that information real time gives that AI the info it needs to connect. And so we have now these real NPCs in a sense that these real connections with AI and yeah, it opens a whole can of worms, but at the same time, this is the kind of thing that augmented reality gives us. It projects info data, objects, experiences into our world. That's augmented reality. Virtual reality is us putting on something to enter into a world. Mm -hmm. Mixed reality is the fusion of those two things. I'm going into a world, but I can see the rest of the world around me as well. Or what I see in virtual reality lines up with what I feel in the real world. Mm -hmm. So that's a mixed reality experience. Those are kind of the three definitions. And augmented reality is so awesome because we know it's going to happen. Yes. There's no doubt we want more information. It's happening now. Right. It's ha that's, I think that's one of the biggest barriers we've got, though, is the developer tools just lacking. Because when in the early days, thinking back to the accelerometer, to get that data required a lot of low-level programming. You had to, for example, you had to know... I need to read from memory address, whatever, get that value, translate it to a range of values, and now I know what the tilt of this phone is based right. on this accelerometer. Right. That took a lot of, you need a lot of programming smarts to be able to do that. Right. That's where AR is right now. You need creativity. You need not only the, you need that special intersection of the creativity of having the low-level developer mind but to combine that with an experience that you can enjoy you have you're the amount of brain power you're expending to write the infrastructure that supports the real the experience you want to build right is high right versus once you get to the point where you are able to write that experience you're basically tired and i think back to your point about where apps were a couple years ago versus where they are now that barrier to development between file new and having a finished project product is a lot lower let me challenge you on that though okay and ask the question is that not the greatest creative challenge though I agree with you on one dimension and completely disagree on another. That's totally fair. I agree on the dimension that getting to that point is what gives us those huge leaps forward. Right. So somebody will eventually come up with a toolkit that shows here's how we here's the infrastructure and plumbing to make AR experiences easily. 
That is an incredible expression of creativity. We've seen it countless times in the developer community. Right. Where I disagree is I look at the technology and go, what purpose is it serving? Right. Is it actually solving a problem? I'm going to call it the real world. I usually say, is it solving a problem in the real world? Mm-hmm. But now I can extend that definition to, is it solving a problem in our experiential world? Right. And if the answer is no, then I look at that and go, that feels like if I'm an average developer wanting to use this platform to make something, I look at that and go, that is not a good use of my time. That's a very fair criticism. I think, though generally, that's a criticism for all of development. Oh, yeah. So the idea that I'm just diving into a technology because it's cool is not really the ideal way for a developer to spend their time. I think the ideal developer, and I think we'll get to this point for sure, is one in which they're able to say, okay, I have this problem I want to solve. What is the right interface for this? Yes. Is this an augmented reality interface problem? Is this something I can solve with augmented reality as interface? Is this something I can solve with virtual reality as interface? I'll give you a great example. Okay. And when I think about making the ideal meditation experience for someone who has the challenge of meditation is just not that exciting for me. I'm not sure if I should do it. I don't know if it's for me. So I think, okay, how can I create an environment that makes that person see what I see with meditation? Where would they need to be in the world for them to experience that? So for example, if I put them in front of a beautiful waterfall with a forest behind them, with the birds flying above, they're so present. They just see all these beautiful things. They're so excited. They're in awe. And then I say to them, hey, are you open to experiencing a meditation? Or I don't even say meditation. I say, are you open to being guided through this experience? So you have an avatar that guides them through the experience. They walk them along to the waterfall. The waterfall glows a little bit. It says, are you ready to meditate? Are you ready to drop into the present moment to recognize how your breath sinks up to the world? How the waterfall flowing is actually a represent- metaphor for your breath. Notice this flow of how the water hits the water, how the water rises up, how it goes down mm-hmm. and up and down. Notice how your breath sinks up. So that kind of experience, to me, that's a great use of virtual reality. Now, someone else might say, well, Daniel, but they have to close their eyes eventually because this is a meditation. So you're probably gonna say, close your eyes. Yes, that's true. But how challenging is it for me to set a container, a context for someone to have a deep meditation experience? Mm-hmm. It's pretty challenging. I've got to set up a room. I've got to set up the sounds, the smells, the experience, the softness. All of these details are things that meditation facilitators are constantly thinking. Well, virtual reality allows me to do all of that at once. And so to me, that's the right interface for the experience. Now I might say, okay, well, how do I improve the data in a room of researchers? So if I'm thinking, okay, I'm a geologist. I'm studying the earth. I'm studying how the earth reacts when we drill in one area. What does this core look like? Well, the most effective thing for that person is probably going to have real-time feedback of things occur. And so augmented reality is a great interface for that. You interpose real-time representations of the data. You basically represent things like drilling or seismic activity as graphs, but they don't have to be normal graphs. They can be 3D artistic abstract representations of that whoa suddenly i can represent way more data with way less numbers right in a way that we can actually understand something that i just thought of when you were mentioning that idea of the waterfall talks to you or an let's say an environmental element right my mind immediately jumped to psychedelic drugs (laughs) No, but seriously, you think about, like, I remember one time back in high school in my grade 12 physics class, one of our classmates came in uh, having had the wonderful experience of having done mushrooms. Right. 
and he was describing to us how it was really hard to walk to school when he was melting into the sidewalk and the houses were screaming at him. That sounds challenging. That sounds very challenging. Hilarious. He was wearing sunglasses the whole day. I thought, you really want to wear sunglasses inside? But A layer of safety. A layer of safety. Yeah, no kidding. What the implications, though, of having an, of saying, okay, we could have environmental elements that are, I don't want to say alive, but to a certain extent have living properties. Okay. That's blurring of reality. Yeah, that, that's a blurring of reality. But again, I think back to if you listen, have, do you listen to Joe Rogan's podcast at all? Quite a bit. He's talked about that idea that plants are alive. Right. And that they're responding to us, or more re- more accurately, he thinks, that we're they basically model their behavior to control us. And or I that think, they have a layer of consciousness. I think even if you go down to the simplest logical explanation for that mm-hmm. argument, it kind of makes sense. What else would they be doing other than trying to outcompete the environment? We're part of the environment. We're part of their ecosystem. When a tree thinks I need to get water, I need to be close to sun, I need to do my processes correctly, it considers through basically what are the challenges for me getting water? How far can my roots reach? Okay, I need to grow them farther. Okay, I need to go deeper. Okay, there's a rock here. Okay, there's a human here. You know, these, these are barriers to plants and trees and when we when you look at a system of plants and trees or fungi for example then you can start to see how this system of processes are morphing around the greater environment which we are part of the earth itself is alive in a very real sense in that it's constantly reorganizing itself to optimize so that the most amount of things can live and thrive Mm -hmm. so if we think of just plants then of course they're constantly reorganizing in relation to all living beings, which we are a part of that. And so in a a very real way, they're trying to control the outcome of the universe, of the world, of earth, of the interactions with it by slightly moving or slightly growing in one direction or reorganizing an ecosystem. If you ever sort of see forests change over time if you ever look at like a video of like a forest and how it grows and how it moves in relation to how buildings erupt right so a building comes up shade forms around an area and suddenly you see all the trees you know sort of start to grow to the left away from where the shade is Mm. right they're trying to reorganize so they can out compete what what else is happening in their environment they don't necessarily think oh those are humans over there we better out compete those humans they're plants i mean they're thinking about plant things if they're thinking at all most likely they're probably just organizing rather than thinking they're just constantly organizing in relation to processes that impact them like the sun like water like nutrients and so if you were to say is that is that plants trying to outcompete humans to survive of course it's evolutionary pressure to survive it's they want to just like we want to now want is a sort of term in here that's like what does want mean sure but we'll just move past that and the idea of plants and trees living and being a part of our ecosystem and being important i mean we don't have plants we're gonna have a serious problem of air quality issues, right? So we're in this ecosystem with those plants, with those trees, with all living beings. And so how we see ourselves in relation to that, we could see a flat structure, we could see a hierarchy, it's up to us. I think Joe Rogan likes to often talk about the importance of seeing it sometimes as a flat structure in that we are just as as much a part on the same earth. Right. I don't know what your original point was, but I just wanted to go deep into that for a moment. My orig- I love the fact you went deep on that. My original point, and I actually thought about it, it came to me while you were talking about that. Mm-hmm. My original point was now that we're opening up the idea of elements in this virtual environment can have lifelike qualities, right. or we can assign them lifelike qualities, we can start to talk about spiritual experiences inside of virtual reality. Right. 
imagine being able to have a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience that moves you somehow in a virtual reality environment. Have we done that yet? I mean, I've had a lot of spiritual experiences while in virtual reality. Really? Yeah, because the expansion of your concept of what is possible is, in my opinion, a spiritual experience. Waking up one day and thinking all we can have in this world is people traveling physically to places and then realizing the next day that I can put on a headset and be there, that's expansive. That is a shifting of what I think is possible. That opening of my mind is worthy of being called a spiritual experience for me. There's other things like the realization that things can change in ways that I couldn't predict Mm. in experiences. Like, for example, the experience of climbing in virtual reality, something that I've always kind of thought about but never done because it's dangerous, (laughs) in my opinion. And, like, I don't necessarily have... I haven't practiced doing it. So I don't I don't know I don't know the steps to getting good enough that I would feel comfortable doing it. Well in virtual reality I could just do it. I play this game called the climb. And you just reach for and you reach and you keep climbing and you keep going up and up and it's tiring. You're stressed. You have to hold all the buttons. Your your hands actually start to cl- clam up and you you feel stressed when you fall. It's quite the experience of falling. Ooh. And it's because it's on the edge of a real experience where you feel that, that your adrenaline rises, that you feel the need to do it, and then you get to the top. You get to the top, you get to the peak, and you look above and it's actually so beautiful. You can see the sun's setting, the mountains, the beautiful vista of the area. You can look around 360 and see something. That, the first time I experienced it, was like a spiritual experience for me because I was like, wow. I can really have experiences in this space that are more than what I can do right now in the real world. And they can lead to such beautiful things. And they're not lesser than real experiences. They're just other experiences. And so to me, that was, I think, spiritual. I think now... Obviously, like it depends on what you define a spiritual experience to be. I mean, like, did I do I? Can you find God in virtual reality? Well, I, I don't know. It, that that depends on the person and and like what they're seeking in life, right? Like, a spiritual experience can be a lot of different things. I have a pretty flexible opinion of spiritual experience. To me, spiritual experience is something that shifts my concept of the world, opens me up to more possibilities, and almost causes this a new concept map in my head i'm like whoa i just realized whoa that's to me like the cornerstone of a spiritual experience to me wow i'm thinking about what you just said that idea of wow opening up new experiences opening up a new map of meaning Every time I think back to anyone that's ever described a psychedelic experience, like DMT or mushrooms or something like that, they've said something similar. Maybe that's what ties all this entire point together, is now we have a tool that we can alter our perception of reality without having to consume a substance and have those same experiences. What you're describing with the amount of passion in your voice is the exact same kind of passion I've heard from anyone I've talked to who's ever done any kind of psychedelic that has changed their world. Yeah, how we like to describe it sort of in the sort of concept. So so there's a lot of ways we can describe human experience. And I'm not saying that in any sort of a bad way. I just want to clarify that. I'm saying that as I'm seeing somebody who's had the same experience without the requirement of a chemical. Right. 
So the way that we describe human experience in psychology is variable. There's lots of different models. One of the ones that I connect to the most is the altered states model. The idea that we have our normal self, what we kind of expect our experience to be, and then things happen to us and we shift, right? You, you experience this when you experience a lot of stress, right? Life is different. Things can seem really fast, really intense. Everything seems like catastrophic if it occurs badly. It's an altered state. You're, you're changing states. In the same way, when you meditate, you can enter into this sort of peaceful calmness where nothing, as you described at the beginning, right? Nothing feels you know, so important that you really need to attend to it right now. What's happening right now is what's more important. Then there's the experience of psychedelics, of shrooms, of LSD, and they shift you into different states of experience. Meditation, just like virtual reality, allows for this shifting. And so when we talk about what's possible with virtual reality, we talk about what is the state that people could enter into this? I mean, it's really an open state because when you when you go into virtual reality, you don't know what's possible because all of the rules of the world have melted away. This is a simulation. Anything could happen. And yes, you do contain the rules by your choosing the experience. So you kind of know what to expect. But because it's not really limited by much, it's so amazing what could happen in it. And so it, it can shift you all over the place because you're literally experiencing new things constantly. And the experience of new things shifts you into a different state because you weren't in, you can't, because you didn't experience this before, it's not your normal state. You're, ex you're now in the new experience state. And that new experience state is, is like similar to what people describe psychedelics to be. These are new experiences that go beyond what their mind could normally produce on their own without an extra chemical substrate. I feel like I haven't given virtual reality enough credit in recent years. And I feel, <laughs> I feel slightly more enlightened than I did a while ago, let's say. That I'm doing my job. <laughs> no kidding. That is absolutely profound. Yeah, and maybe I can speak to that, what you just said, which I think is an important point. I think virtual reality... The reason why it hasn't gone mainstream, as we like to use in the technology world, is partially because, one, it's a new technology. Two, we're just learning to create experiences for it that are that much more different from our normal experiences. Honestly, the, the, at first, we were just creating a bunch of experiences that were just, just a little bit extensions of what regular video games can do. We're only starting to get that creativity, that edge in development, Recently, in the last year and going forwards, what I'm seeing people are developing for next year, now we're starting to get into experiences that are only possible with virtual reality. When we start to see the things that are only possible with virtual reality, that's where things get really exciting. That's the happy spot. That's exciting. Yeah. And I think we're making that leap one foot at a time. And I'm very excited for that. And in fact, that's kind of what Vert VR Arcade is all about, is going to be exploring experiences and a lot of them. I mean, our idea is opening with hundreds of experiences so that we can curate, design, and think through what is the right combination of experiences for someone, as opposed to just throw them into virtual reality and tell them what they should like. Mm. No, that's not what VR is about. People are just trying to learn how to use this technology. You've got to think hard about what it is they want to achieve or what it is you hope for them to experience and think about how those things organize. I mean, when someone says, hey, I haven't really watched any horror movies, you don't just haphazardly throw a horror movie at them. <laughs> you think through, okay, what are they ready for? How scared are they going to be with a certain experience? Are they ready for The Shining? Or what is the right one for them? <laughs> So I think that's that's part of what's also been missing with virtual reality is this idea of of curating of 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 thinking through what this person should experience, and that's what we're hoping to. And that's what you know that's what really matters to me. I mean, I've spent so much time facilitating meditation experiences and thinking through what are the right meditations for the right contexts, 
And I, I think the same way about virtual reality is how, how, how is this the right experience for the right person, for the right context with the right technology? Isn't it funny how some of these skills we develop in life, and again, this is a recurring theme in the podcast. I've talked about it with Greg. I've talked about it with Leanne. I've talked about it with Wayne, W.T. Hamilton. This idea of collecting all these different skills and then suddenly we can apply them in what seem like totally separate areas. What you described just now of guiding somebody through a meditation and how that applies to augmented or virtual reality, when you hear it like that, it makes total sense. Right. Maybe that's why VR, aside from the technology side, there's always the technology side. It has to be at a certain point where it can support these experiences at a price that the regular person can afford. Right. But there's also having the right people around who know or have the skills to take people through this tech. Right. That's where I come in in the event industry with my app Tractus. It's I'm not just coming in as, hey, I've got an event app and let's use it and it'll make your life easier. It's I'm coming into this. I've run the audiovisual for events. I am a speaker. I run the whole gamut. I've done event organization through Mo Mondays and other events that I've run. Like I've done the whole gamut of all these different parts of an event. So the app I've developed is in direct response to needing different parts to be facilitated through technology. Right. So in that way, I'm able to say, well, on your agenda, let's run these two. You've got one session over here and one session over here. We'll run them as separate tracks so that people can pick and choose where they want to be and they'll know where they should be. When we're doing registration, it's, you know, we have our express table over here for people that have checked in and we have our regular registration table for people that haven't downloaded the app yet or are buying at the door. You know, kind of like what you would have at the airport. You've got the express check-in line where everybody's checked in ahead of time or online. They can go through there and go real quick. And then you have the slow line for everybody else. Right. But again, it's having that person that guide who can take you through that experience and where i'm going at with this theme is it's never a linear path to come up with the solution of, yeah the to plan. come up with to come up with the solution yeah would you have predicted 25 years ago when you were negative one years old, <laughs> that you would take the precise path that you've taken to launch VRcadia. No. I wouldn't have even predicted that two and a half years ago. Thank you. I feel a lot better about myself as a person knowing that I have somebody who thinks exactly the same way. Yeah, I mean, I think once you let go of the idea that you know the next thing, and you just start to live your life one moment to the next, always constantly thinking, how can I be better? I think Jocko Willick talks a lot about that. Yeah. Your purpose, your ability to motivate yourself, knowing that you're living the best life you can live, and then you just keep living, and you keep going from thing to thing to thing. The path just unfolds. Yeah. And you can't fight it. You can try. But you won't succeed. Yeah. It'll be a miserable... Yeah. And I think it's part of the process to suffer oh, yeah. to suffer in resistance. But... And you can always... You can only look back and be like, oh, God, why did I spend so much time suffering through that? I wish I would have just leaped forwards. But, you know, for example, like I have the personality where I, I often overthink things for a long time before taking action. Yes. And I meditation, luckily has taught me confidence in my own, myself in knowing that when I make a decision, it's okay to take a step forwards into that decision. You don't need to take two steps back and look forwards and be like, is this going to hurt me? Is this going to damage this? No, in, instead it's okay to just to fall. And it goes back to what we talked about. It's okay to, the worst thing that can happen is I fail right now, but that's okay because I've already counted for that as a part of the process. Sure. Maybe it's a stepping stone to something even bigger. 
and I'm going to learn a lot. And it's when I think about my own life and anything, any occasion where I go, oh man, I kind of regret that decision. In a way, I am thankful for the fact that I regret that decision because it's a reminder of the pain of making a decision because somebody else's hand was on that switch. Right. Helping me guide it. Right. And it wasn't the decision that I wanted to make. Right. Now I know what that pain feels like. And I don't want to go down that path again. Right. And while the there might be some temporary pain of making a decision that others don't agree with, the long-term outcome of and having confidence in, in one's decisions, that's a tough one. Right. And I feel like there's a lot of people that never think about that or they think about it, but they never act on it. Right. They never think to themselves, what if I took direct responsibility for this? What if I made the best possible decision right. for me? Because yeah, that for me part is hard too, because how do you tease apart what you want yeah. from what you think you want yeah. and from what everybody else wants you to want? And that pressure from peers, from family, that can be immense. Yeah, even from yourself. Yeah. We have this like double life we live, right? We live the life we're actually living yeah. and we live the life we think we're living. Yes. And how close those things are can vary all the time. I mean, we often experience extreme joy from an event that's happening and then experience sadness right after because we're in the throngs of that experience, right? Yeah. But what is the real experience? Like, are these things really that extreme that they cause these emotions? We're just constantly reacting, right? But why do we react the way we do? Well, there's the whole context of things that happened before and things that we're thinking will happen after. Yeah. It's, you know, it goes back to this really, I mean, this is going to sound really divergent in a lot of ways, but it goes back to this idea in, in Buddhism, which is, you know, we often, you know, a lot, a lot of people always say to me, you know, well, those, you know, but Buddhist monks seems like they don't care about the world. They seem like they're just on their mountain doing their own thing. They've separated themselves. They don't experience emotions like we do. But when you talk to a Buddhist monk, which I have, it's not their experience. Their experience is that they experience those things happening, but they're not reacting, they're observing them happening. Rather than feeling a need to react, they observe as the emotion wells up within them. As the wave passes over them of that emotion, they experience everything that comes with that without reacting. And they experience it going away. Because what happens, our psychology is, if we experience sadness, we feel we must be really sad. So we experience, so as something sad happens to us, we realize it's sad, then we feel sad, then we are sad, then we're trying not to be sad anymore. Mm. How much of that is the experience of the actual, the truth, the reality, the thing, the sadness that occurs with it? So for example, the grief. And how much of that is the added, I'm reacting to how sad I am? Mm. So it's not about observing and not being a part of sadness or happiness or all these experiences, but it's about actually diving deeper into it, experiencing it more fully, more raw, because you're not shying away. You're just experiencing the thing. And so you recover faster for sure. Like I noticed that in myself because I meditate so much when sad things or happy or angry or exciting things happen. I experience it really fully, so much everywhere in my body. And then I let go of it and I'm on to the next experience. Now, it doesn't always happen to me, <laughs> but when it does, when I'm really mindful, when I'm really there for the experience of happiness, I feel so happy, so purely happy. And then I'm done with it because the experience is over and the next experience has another whole quality to it that I want to be there for. You want to be able to dedicate that mental brain power to yeah. that next experience. Exactly. And by that, you'll be able to be the best person you can possibly be to everyone around you. Right. Wow. I feel like that's a good point to close things off because we've had 
maybe this is kind of like a meditative experience because over two hours has gone by just like that. Wow. Yeah. That's immensely great. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. It was a really great conversation. I love this. This went, I've got lots of notes. We've got lots to talk about next time. Perfect. And I certainly hope that there will be a next time. There will definitely be. Excellent. Where can people find out more about you? Virtual reality stuff at VRcadia Tech. So V R C A D I A Tech. That's on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Our locations at 750 Richmond Street, Richmond and Oxford, and we'll be opening quite soon. And that's in London, Ontario, Canada, folks. So book your plane tickets. <laughs> and then if you want to find out about meditation stuff at London Mindfulness Community. You can come into any of our drop-in meditations Tuesday nights, 8 to 8.30, and Sundays, 7 to 8.30. I don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but if it comes out before November 25th, then we have the Mindfulness Challenge coming up on that day. That's going to be a really exciting meditation retreat. If it's after that date when it comes out, then I'll have really had a great day. <laughs> and I'm if it's before, then you should definitely come out. It's a charity event where... All proceeds, registration, everything goes to a great cause of giving people meditation programs taught by doctors and clinical psychologists by the Center for Mindfulness Studies. It's a really amazing event to participate in because it's really a meditation retreat in the city where there's just so much to experience from um, just pure focus meditation facilitated by some of the best meditation facilitators in the world, all the way to musical movement meditation that are fun and exciting, that expand your definition of what meditation is and some of the ways that we talked about. And as well, delicious food by Zenza Pizzeria, which is one of my favorite. Yes. I'm so glad you guys have them on board. I know. And I'm really excited to have a mindful eating experience where you meditate with each bite experiencing flavors that you didn't even know were there, taking the time to really enjoy food. And that's one of my favorite meditation experiences is mindful eating, something I don't do very often, we rarely do. Yep. Really diving into every single bite and flavor of how things are constructed, how the layers of flavor interact in our bodies, how we feel as the food hits us. It's very exciting. Okay, so I have something booked on November 25th but the thought that is going through my mind is F that noise, I'm going. <laughs> I hope you're there. I'm going to rearrange my schedule and be there because that awesome. sounds amazing. I want to get Wayne and Jocelyn on this podcast as well. I've, amazing. She was at Mo Mondays a couple weeks ago yeah. telling her story. That was, oh my God. They're great people. They're amazing. I love watching them on Instagram and IGTV. And I love the idea that like Wayne is an architect who also makes pizza. But it makes perfect sense. When you think, well, when you think about it, like it's because there's pizza and then there's the perfectly crafted layers inside of a a, a perfect pizza. And he makes a damn good pizza. Oh man, I cannot wait. And Jocelyn is this like amazing yoga, qigong instructor who's got this really strong concept of spirituality and, and how to facilitate experiences for people and then also runs the business of you know a pizzeria and also a yoga and meditation studio body and soul yeah so they're just amazing people i'm just excited they're in london and everything they're doing is so cool talk about a non-linear path yeah i cannot wait to dig into that one i know i'm that, excited to hear that podcast that is going to be so much fun wayne jocelyn if you're listening to this and I haven't reached out to you by this point, which is probably impossible, <laughs> then you guys have got to come on here. Oh, yeah. We were saying tags to reach out to me. Um, yes. So at London Mindfulness Community on Facebook, on Meetup, on Instagram, uh, we're doing fun stuff where we're trying out live meditations and things like that. Right. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. If you ever have any questions about meditation, feel free to shoot me an email at mindful meditation the number four and the letter U at gmail.com. We love answering questions on meditation. If you're interested in meditation or virtual reality, just reach out to us and uh, come check us out at uh, 750 Richmond. Sweet. And when's your first meditation CD? Do young people still buy CDs? Probably not. 
But when's your first meditation CD going to come out? My because first... you've got the voice for it. I, uh, it's in process, man. It's in process. It is? It's definitely something that I want to, to release in 2019. Yes. So I'm experimenting with the medium of sort of online meditation workshops, live meditations on Instagram and Facebook, and also recording meditations. And it's a process. I think there's a lot for me still to learn with what are the best meditations to record. And I'm only starting to really write my own meditations over the last like six to eight months and started to dive into that creative exploration of what it means to write meditation experiences for the longest time. I I've just used other really great facilitators meditations, but now I'm starting to craft my own style. And so I think the culmination of that will be releasing, um, a meditation, um, series of, of audio rec- audio guided meditations. Yeah. You and uh, Hungarian experiment did a live meditation. That was a couple of weeks ago now, wasn't it? A couple of months. A couple, couple months, months. Oh, Christ. Well, the warmer weather that was there. Yeah, that's true. That was a really cool experience. That's. I want to do a lot more of that when I'm not renovating all day. Yeah, I bet. You look a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. So London Mindfulness Challenge is November 25th. I am going to clear up my schedule to be there. You should too, dear listener. Wow. Daniel, that was incredible thank you you opened up my eyes to a brand new way of seeing augmented virtual reality extended reality in general and i think i'm so excited to see the doors open at vrcadia that is going to be freaking awesome i, I it's bet it's going to be an are. amazing time i bet you are i cannot wait to be there on launch day you're going to be. So, I'm going to make sure you are. Yeah, I will clear out everything else in this. Come hell or high water, I'm going to be there. Amazing. I don't care what happens. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Let's Solve the Universe. This podcast can be heard every Saturday at lstupodcast.com. For more information about Let's Solve the Universe, head over to our Facebook page, Let's Solve the Universe podcast, or check out the Let's Solve the Universe website because you know you want to. Complete show notes and information about all our guests can be found there. And I thank you, dear listener, for sharing your time with us. And we'll talk to you next Saturday.